Hello dear students, in this video, let's learn about anaphylactic shock, right? So when we need to understand about anaphylactic shock, so this is a simple disease, though it is a life-threatening, okay? So how life-threatening it is and how important for every medical professional to know about anaphylactic shock and how to handle the condition and what is the pathophysiology behind it, let's learn about everything. Okay, so let's start with what? Anaphylactic shock. Okay, so when we are speaking of anaphylactic shock, so the first question is, so is it what type of disease it is, right? So anaphylactic shock, my dear students, it's a type of life-threatening allergic reaction. So the point number one, you must remember, it's a life-threatening, yes, life-threatening allergic reaction life threatening allergy so if it is such a life threatening allergy how does it occur that is going to be our next question sir what is the pathophysiology let's look at pathology behind it right so when we are speaking of pathology behind it the <coughs> pathology is very simple so it occurs as a result of something called as Type 1 hypersensitivity, HSN, HSN stands for hypersensitivity, it stands for type 1 hypersensitivity, my dear. So, when we are speaking of type 1 hypersensitivity, what happens and how does it occur, let's learn, right? So, when we are speaking of type 1 hypersensitivity, for example, I have a patient who is allergic to something, be it anything, maybe be it some food, be it some pollen or something, he is allergic, okay? So, when he is allergic, how it is going to work, let's understand, okay? So, whenever allergen will come into the body, what is that? Allergen. So, allergen comes into the body, it serves as an antigen, my dear students. What does it serve as? Antigen. AG stands for antigen. Now, whenever antigen comes into the body, it will go and trigger the formation of antibodies. It could trigger the formation of antibodies. So, when antibodies are formed, which antibodies are formed? Remember, this is a very important question that is immunoglobulin E. What type of antigen? Immunoglobulin E. So, for your information, remember, there are two case scenarios where immunoglobulin E can be elevated. So, immunoglobulin E will be elevated in an allergic condition, that is condition number one. And condition number two is parasite infestation. When? Parasite infestation. Okay. So, when IgE comes, this IgE, where will it go? IgE, it cannot be. Uh, where will I go? It, it is not going to do that. Ig will do something. What it will do? It has to go and settle with someone, right? It cannot be single forever. So, it will go and settle with, uh, it will sit on the mast cell. Where will it sit? Sit on the mast cell, okay? So, it will sit on the mast cell. Where are mast cells located? Mast cells are located everywhere in the body. Almost all the connective tissues of the body can consist of mast cell, right? Okay, so let's consider this is one mast cell. On the mast cell, we have immunoglobulin. That immunoglobulin is which one? Immunoglobulin E. Very nice, right? So when immunoglobulin E is there, so all this process when allergen comes and your immunoglobulin E is formed, this occurs after the first contact. The first contact of what? The first contact, not your girlfriend, not the Girlfriend of your first contact. This is the first contact of allergen. Okay. So, this is the first contact of allergen. Okay. After the first contact of allergen, we call this process as, uh, also called as uh, antigen sensitization. What is that called as? Antigen sensitization, my dear student. So, antigen sensitization. Like how you look at some girl for the first time. Wow, you get shocked, right? Or you get mesmerized. Like that only, you will get very sensitive. Like that only, when allergen comes into body, your immunoglobulin E will become very sensitized and your antigen has been sensitized. Now, how you fixate on the same person, like that only, this immunoglobulin E fixates for this antigen, which is that antigen. Which is that antigen? That is the allergen, right? Okay. Now, after this, now will you be quiet? No. Automatically, what will you do? You will go in search for the second contact. So, exactly during the second contact. During the second contact with what? The second contact with allergen. Second contact with what? Allergen. 
So when there is a second contact with allergen, my dear students, what will happen? Right? So when there is a second contact with the allergen, now what will happen? Let's see. So this is a mast cell. On the mast cell, who was sitting? Yes, very good. Come on, tell me. Immunoglobulin E. So immunoglobulin E is sitting. Now your antigen will come. So antigen always get attracted to what? Exactly to your immunoglobulin. Once antigen and this antibody immunoglobulin E binds together, that will lead to something called as degranulation of mast cell. What will happen? Degranulation of mast cell. Okay. So mast cell will start to what? Mast cell will start to break down. Mast cell will start to break down. So because of this degranulation, my dear students, all the contents of mast cell will be released. So basically what happened? Very simple. Mast cell was broken. Whatever was inside the mast cell will be released. So it will release biologically active substance. What are those? Biologically active substance. Biologically active substance. Okay, so what are these biologically active substances? For us, the most important biologically active substance, my dear students, that is your histamine. That is your histamine. Now, once histamine is released, what can histamine can do? So histamine will go and act on the multiple systems of the body. Let's look at each one of it. The first thing which histamine can do is its action on the respiratory system. What will it do? Respiratory system. So if it is acting on the respiratory system, what exactly it will do? So remember, it will activate which receptor? H1 receptors which are located in your respiratory epithelium leading to bronchoconstriction. Bronchoconstriction. All right. That is one effect of the histamine. Then what else it can do? My dear students, uh, histamine can also affect your skin. So once it affects your skin, so histamine actually speaking, whenever H1 receptor again in the skin, which receptor? H1 receptors, when they're getting activated, again they will lead to allergy, rash, inflammation, etc. Okay. Then during the symptoms, I'll come to each and every system. Why? symptoms okay and also it will act upon one of the most important system that is cardiovascular system on the cardiovascular system when histamine receptor h1 are activated my dear students they will increase uh, this is a very important point many students make a mistake directly histamine causes vasodilation actually it is not a direct effect of histamine rather when h1 receptors are activated that will increase the activity of NO that is your nitric oxide on the blood vessel when nitric oxide on the blood vessel is activated so that will lead to what is that vasodilation vasodilation means that will decrease the bp that will decrease the blood pressure so these are the effects of histamine on the body as a result of degradation of mast cell so when mast cell degradation occurs why does it occur this is the pathophysiology so once we understood the pathophysiology let's understand what can cause Right? So, what can cause the anaphylactic shock? So, remember, there are multiple factors, right? So, multiple factors such as what? For example, insect bites. Yes, this is a very, very important point to be remembered. Insect bites, my dear students, they can lead to what? Anaphylactic shock. Okay? So, that is why <coughs> some people who have honey bee sting can end up land up into anaphylactic shock. Okay, insect bites. Okay, the next important ones. What is that? Food products. Okay, food products. Food products such as, for example, some people are allergic to what? Peanuts. Okay, so the classic example, you might have watched the series called as Big Bang Theory. In Big Bang Theory, there is a character called as Valwitz. So, whenever he eats nuts, okay, not that nuts, I mean, like, you know, that ground nuts or something like that, definitely he'll get what is that? Peanuts. So whenever he eats peanuts, the person can get what is that? He used to get an anaphylactic reaction or an allergic reaction, severe allergic reaction. Okay. All right. Let's get back from the nuts and let's continue. Okay. Apart from there, the most important ones are your drugs, my dear students. What are those? Drugs. So majorly, what are the drugs which can lead to anaphylactic shock? Few of them you need to remember. One of them very commonly is NSAIDs, that is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. What is that? non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. 
apart from non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs what else can cause what is that exactly what is that it is anaphylactic reaction so that is your sulfur drugs what is that sulfur drugs such as your sulfonamides but sulfonamides you have to remember one more type of life threatening allergic reaction they can cause what is that come on yes that is your steven johnson syndrome sjs okay all right now apart from that one more thing that is your local anesthetics what is that local anesthetics okay so these are the drugs which are commonly encountering with anaphylaxis there is no rule that only these drugs will cause other drugs can also cause anaphylaxis but one of the few drugs which we commonly encounter the anaphylactic reactions are with these ones okay now all right so once we understood the cause so cause is basically whenever you are exposed to that particular trigger the person is getting anaphylactic shock what happens in anaphylactic shock already we know that so now let's understand the clinical features of anaphylactic shock right so when we are speaking of clinical features of anaphylactic shock so it depends particularly on the amount of antigen exposed first thing and it also depends upon which system gets involved so let's go to the first and most important that is your skin actually okay skin is the least of our problems when we are speaking of an anaphylactic reaction but still i want to discuss about because if i go through the important symptoms of cardiovascular and respiratory most of our beautiful students sir we want to ignore the skin right so let's start from there only so in the skin what can happen so i told you people histamine receptors are activated when histamine receptors are activated what happens yes very good so they can lead to rash they can lead to rash they can also lead to for example urticaria urticaria like symptoms okay is not absolutely urticaria urticaria like symptoms okay then there can be patient can have redness okay so these are the few clinical features associated with skin if only skin is involved then the person is lucky actually because why because because it is a milder form of anaphylactic shock if only skin is involved i can say okay but uh, usually we don't call it as a anaphylactic shock if single system is involved okay so you, during clinical feature remember it usually involves uh, multiple systems it usually involves multiple systems involvement okay so already we discussed uh, what are the symptoms we, what are the systems which will involve one is cardiovascular one is skin and one more very good come on tell me respiratory so let's go to the next important aspect what is that respiratory system right so when we are speaking of respiratory system all of you already know one thing what is that there is a bronco constriction if there is a bronco constriction will the patient be able to breathe is there difficult to breathe come on tell me bronchus is gone narrow narrow means is not able to inhale more so automatically the patient can land up in dyspnea patient can land up in dyspnea patient can also have stridor patient can also have stridor right and also patient can have one more thing that is only called as a laryngeal edema okay so laryngeal edema my dear students actually it is not a clinical feature i can say something which we find when we are doing a clinical examination when we are doing a clinical examination okay so dyspnea stridor laryngeal edema okay so and also patient can have increase of respiratory rate and also patient will have decrease of spo2 saturations can go down so these are some important respiratory system involving symptoms let's get into the next and most important uh, that is cardiovascular system as i have already told you people cardiovascular system so what will be there so there is a increase of uh, no activity no is nitric oxide activity so automatically that will cause vasodilation vasodilation will lead to decrease of bp decrease of bp means it is basically a shock so it is not always a shock patient will be having a severe decrease of bp which patient can land up in a shock and which can even lead to loss of consciousness which can even lead to loss of consciousness maybe as a response there might be slight increase of heart rate but which is not a significant thing so these are the few important clinical features which are associated with what that is your anaphylactic shock so if the patient is having anaphylactic shock so how do we diagnose so most of the time diagnosis is very very important diagnosis so if you are making a diagnosis uh, so being a doctor what is important you need to always look at the history be it you are solving a question be it you are treating a patient 
in either ways you need to look at the history so when you take a proper history a lot of the information will be there so that will help you drive to the diagnosis so proper history for example patient was brought to the hospital in an unconscious state after intake of some painkiller right so that history of painkiller will tell you okay he has intaken the painkiller right so please understand diagnosis is actually clinical diagnosis okay so we don't have to do any test so we just clinically diagnose the case based on the history and based on the symptoms we clinically correlate and we make the diagnosis of anaphylactic shock right so once you have diagnosed the case so how do we treat this patient so to treat this patient as i told you in the start of the video what did i tell you yes what did i tell it is a life threatening allergy and your bronchus is going close right bronchus is going close and also bp is falling down so first and most important thing secure airway secure the airways okay so and next important what exactly you are going to do exactly secure the airways then breathing then breathing and circulation okay so a b c so you are going to do what is that so you are going to make sure the patient is having a proper airways maintained and breathing should be provided with a mask a mask and back ventilation or if needed if needed severe hypoxia is there for example so less than 80% is going you can even go for intubation but intubation can become a difficult part here because of the laryngeal edema there is no mandatory rule that all the patients will have a laryngeal edema but there is a possibility of laryngeal edema on the next ones okay so first thing you need abc so that which you can tell me sir we do it for all the patient you don't have to worry about it we have learned it so main important basics we know so the next important thing what is that the drug of choice right so drug of choice has a lot of importance to the like you know anaphylactic shock and also for the students like you know who are appearing for any exam be it like you know be it need be it inst for example be it any other exam be it university exam every exam this drug is very 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 important the drug of choice is adrenaline what is that adrenaline okay so that is your epinephrine so adrenaline they won't stop you directly they'll ask you why you give adrenaline what is the dose of adrenaline so the first and most important let's start with the most important basic adrenaline how do you give adrenaline so usually preferred route is intramuscular over subcutaneous intramuscular is better than subcutaneous sir so why because some books might tell you so subcutaneous only it's given see remember so subcutaneous has less absorption of adrenaline has less adrenaline absorption okay so that is why we are going to prefer preferred route is what intramuscular is the preferred route so if we are giving intramuscular so where is the intramuscular we are going to select are we going to give it in the deltoid or in the gluteus or somewhere else usually preferred is the most important quadriceps muscle that is the lateral vastus muscle what is that lateral vastus muscle okay so lateral vastus muscle is the preferred site okay so that is first thing the second thing you are going to get okay now i have decided that where to give the injection now i'll have the next important fundamental question always sir what is the dose so the dose what we are going to prefer my dear students usually 0.3 to 0.5 ml 0.3 to how many ml 0.5 ml and it has to be how much dilution is also important 0.3 to 0.5 ml of 1 in 1000 one in 1000 diluted adrenaline one in 1000 diluted adrenaline will be the preferred route for what is preferred dose for your adrenaline administration so the next important uh, the fundamental question comes to us is why why adrenaline only why adrenaline only right so why adrenaline only let's understand my dear students uh, when we are speaking of adrenaline when we are speaking of what is that adrenaline so adrenaline my dear students it has effect on so particularly it has effect on it will stimulate alpha 1 receptor alpha 2 receptor and also it will stimulate beta 1 receptor and also it will stimulate beta 2 receptor 
So if they're stimulated, then why are we using this only? Let's understand, right? So what is the, let's make it like this, uh, okay? Problem. Okay, what, what is the problem? So what is the mechanism of action of adrenaline? How we are going to solve it? So the first and most important problem, my dear students, the patient is in shock. Shock means low BP, decrease of BP, okay? So why adrenaline is given? Because adrenaline will stimulate the alpha-1 receptor. So alpha-1 receptor activation, all of you already know that alpha-1 receptors are located on the blood vessels, especially smooth muscles of the blood vessel. They'll cause vasoconstriction and that will lead to increase of BP. That is problem number one. So right the second important thing the patient is also having bronchospasm patient is also having what is that bronchospasm so since the patient is having a bronchospasm whenever you give adrenaline whenever you give adrenaline remember my dear students this is a very very important point it will go and activate beta 2 receptor on the bronchus on the bronchus sir why not the beta 2 receptors on <laughs> located on the blood vessel so remember beta 2 receptors are located both on the blood vessel as well as bronchus but whenever adrenaline is given at a high dose on the blood vessel always uh, at a higher dose alpha 1 will only get activated this is only called as vasomotor phenomenon of dales okay anyways uh, now so it will activate the beta 2 receptors on the bronchus so if beta 2 receptors are activated it will cause bronchodilation it will cause what is that? Bronchodilation. Okay. So bronchodilation will occur. So one more problem sorted. And the next <coughs> important aspect. Uh, so the problem is, my dear students, uh, what exactly is the problem? The main problem, the culprit fellow itself is histamine. The histamine itself is a problem, right? So why we are preferring adrenaline only? One more reason is there. Adrenaline, whatever is there, it is natural antagonist. It is a natural antagonist of histamine it is a natural antagonist of histamine natural antagonist of histamine is whom adrenaline that's it so these are the few reasons why we prefer adrenaline over any other drug during the treatment of anaphylactic shock okay so <coughs> once we have given these the next important question is so why can't we use steroids and antihistamines okay so when we are speaking of steroids and antihistamines steroids and antihistamines again this is a very important fundamental mcq based questions okay so when we are speaking of steroid and antihistamines please remember my dear students steroids and antihistamines they're not they're not used no that is not the statement they're not the drug of choice they're not the first line they're not the first line why there are few reasons because they have slow onset of action and we need the action immediately the immediate action can be achieved only through adrenaline that's why we prefer them so they are not the first line but yes we do use them we do use those drugs okay so most importantly if i ever ask you all of the following are used in the treatment of anaphylactic shock except uh, so steroids yes they are used but not uh, immediate effective but they can be considered of course we will add them antihistamines again we'll add them for example when we are speaking of your what is that adrenaline adrenaline also we are going to use so all of the following except you can answer the the last one whatever is given but the first line management is always what is that yes that is your that is your what is that that is your adrenaline okay so what is a complication what is that complication my dear students actually sometimes sometimes some cases <coughs> what can happen is that so this anaphylactic shock can lead to a complication that is your myocardial infraction and angina these are the two important complications which can occur but very rare cases that can occur as a result of anaphylactic reaction so sir what are the important things you need to remember first which immunoglobulin is mediated. That's the first thing. And <clears throat> second thing, what is that? Physiology in that immunoglobulin and degranulation. That is only first, that is first sensitization and second contact. Then what is the drug of choice and how do we manage the patient? Apart from that, what are the advices we give the patient? So the first and most important, we tell the patient, stay away from the trigger. What
what is that avoid the triggers what is that avoid triggers so how do we avoid triggers so avoid triggers means we need to find out the trigger so for example i know that i know that i have a patient who is allergic to non steroidal anti inflammatory drug now since i know that i will also educate my patient avoid triggers i'll also educate my patient saying that see you have this particular issue so you are not supposed to take the painkiller and he has to keep that in mind so educate the patient and so make sure triggers have been avoided and only after that we can prevent the effects of yes very importantly what is that very importantly anaphylactic attacks okay so there are some people who are allergic to antibiotics seriously they get anaphylactic shock as a result of antibiotics okay so this is also a possibility way for the anaphylactic shock so basically it is a excessive exaggerated immune response okay so keep following for more thank you subscribe